Part 4. Approaches and techniques for supporting a young person with an eating disorder. The first strategy is the language that we use about the young person and about their illness. We try really hard to hold on to the fact that this is a young person who is a wonderful human being, who's got some amazing skills and gifts and talents. And we try to behave in a way that is respectful and kind and loving towards them, whilst at the same time having to do some things that are really unpleasant. We find ourselves having to sit with young people for hours sometimes, encouraging them to eat. Sometimes we end up having to do blood tests on a regular basis, observations on a regular basis, restrict their freedoms. We find ourselves having to do things that they don't enjoy and we don't enjoy doing either. And holding together the, the love or the kindness, the respect of the young person, but being absolutely clear that we can't negotiate with a life-threatening disease any more than we would negotiate with meningitis or leukemia. And therefore, one of the catchphrases, one of the things I've tried to, to hold on to is this idea of relentless kindness, that we have very, very clear expectations, very clear boundaries. We try to be incredibly consistent. Eating disorders are fantastic at finding the little gaps between what one person says and what the next person says, one meal time to the next meal time. We try to be relentlessly kind but at the same time absolutely clear that if we've said something is going to be this way, that it is this way 24-7, regardless of who is there in front of the patient. To do this, we can't overcomplicate our lives. We have to keep it incredibly simple. Eating disorders at their heart are actually really simple disorders in terms of some of the very basic practical applications. They're incredibly complex psychological, psychiatric disorders, but in terms of the day-to-day -day getting meals into people, getting them to eat, supporting them with those needs, if you can get the basics right and be very, very clear about what those basics are, then you stand a chance of the eating disorder not finding its way through the gaps. One of the things I've noticed with the young people we've been looking after is that they seem to have lost any sense of hope. This is a very basic human need to have hope. We all need to believe that there is better to come, that I can overcome this, that there is a brighter future ahead of me. And what we see in the young people we look after is that they've often lost all sense of hope. They often believe that this is just the way it is, this is just the way they are, that there's no way forward. They've lost any hope that they might ever achieve the goals that they previously aspired to. Unfortunately, this often takes the parents with them and the parents start to lose hope as well. We, as professionals, as people around the family, need to hold on to that hope. We need to guard that hope. We have to know that the science says that we can do this despite all the evidence that might be in front of us, all the tantrums, all the difficulties at mealtimes, we have to be the ones who guard that hope so that as the young person starts to get better, we can start giving it back to them and they can start holding it for themselves. One of the real challenges I've found is learning to talk a different language. Many of the ways of talking that I've learned as a parent and as a pediatrician simply don't work when I'm talking to somebody with an eating disorder. And I have to be really careful and I have to be really clear with them that sometimes I'm going to say things that are really unhelpful to them. And I don't mean to be unhelpful, it's just that my usual language might not be helpful. I'll give you some examples. If I see a patient with asthma, and I say they're looking really well, they take that as a good sign. They're encouraged by the fact that I think they look well and I'm a doctor and I should know what I'm talking about. If I see somebody with an eating disorder and I say they look well, often they will interpret that as me saying they look fat. Similarly, if I come along and I say, oh, thank you so much for eating your lunch, you've run really well today, they might hear, oh, I'm a failure, I gave in, 
I let myself down. I've got to try harder. I'm going to have to exercise more. I'm going to have to do something to pay back because I gave in to what the doctors were saying. I might say something to them like, oh, this has been a really successful week. And they might hear, I've gained weight, I'm getting fat, it's all going horribly wrong. I might tell them they, I think they're incredibly brave. At a time when they think that they're a complete failure, they're in hospital, they're gaining weight, they're doing all the things they don't want to do. And so what I've learned is the language that I use, the words that I use to try and encourage my patients and their families, sometimes that language is incredibly unhelpful and it's really counterintuitive. And I don't think I can give you any really good advice other than to really try and think very hard about the language you use and keep it very, very simple and try and look and watch and think how did that language seem to land because what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinforce positive messages but at the same time we're trying to make sure that we're not saying things that are going to push them further back because they feel like we're winning when actually what we're trying to do is beat an awful disease together. As a general paediatrician I've got used to a very fast turnaround of my patients. Most paediatric patients are on the ward for one to two days. I've got really used to seeing children, making a diagnosis, either making them better or sending them on to a specialist who can. One of the things I've had to learn from my eating disorders colleagues is that is not how eating disorders work. We have to be able to take a longer view many of these young people are going to be troubled by their eating disorder and some of the associated problems for months, sometimes years, before they are truly free of them. One of the things that means for my colleagues and for us and for many people who are encountering an eating disorder for the first time is that we cannot imagine that this is going to be magically better by next Tuesday because it probably isn't. In fact, it almost certainly isn't going to be better by next Tuesday or the Tuesday after. This may take weeks and months. So somehow we have to work out how we get a roadmap to good health by breaking that roadmap down into really short little chunks. One of the things that we've talked a lot and thought about is how you get to the top of a mountain if that mountain is both an awful long way up and the road is very steep and difficult to climb. Well, you don't just put a straight road straight up there because almost certainly if you're trying to cycle up that hill, you're going to fall straight back down. What you do is you put a series of dog legs along the pathway to allow you a nice steady gradient and you then look at each of the hairpins in turn, you focus on that hairpin, you focus on what the target is, and that is all you're thinking about. This is a crucial analogy, because what it allows us to do is to break down a very long, tortuous, difficult process into small chunks. So we don't have to think about where we're aiming for, because that is unimaginably far away. And if we try to think about good health, we're just not going to achieve anything because it's going to be overwhelming. But if we can think about how we get to the end of this meal, how we get to the end of today, how we get to the end of this week, how we get to the end of the month, what are our targets to get to those things, what needs to be in place to get us that. If we can break it down into these little chunks, if we're going to carry on the analogy of cycling, we can't pedal that cycle for the young person. They have to put in the hard yards, but we can make sure that they're on the road and we can make sure that we've looked after them the best we can. And sometimes we need to put a hand onto their back and help them a little way along when they're feeling weak to allow them to keep getting to that next hairpin. And then we can take a breather, we can look at the next bit of the journey we can figure out what that looks like and we can go again. And we can keep doing that for as long as it takes to get to where we need to be. I got into medicine because I wanted to be the good guy. I wanted to be the person who saved somebody's life, who was the hero, who the patient was happy, the parents were happy, everybody's happy. Unfortunately, eating disorders aren't like that. I seem to find quite a lot of my time 
making my patients quite cross with me. They get upset, the parents are upset, everybody's upset. There's no heroism in dealing with eating disorders. It's the constant battle. And I think the thing I find most debilitating about that is sometimes I feel like it's me battling on one end of a rope and at the other end of the rope on the tug of war is the patient. Somehow we seem to be pulling in opposite directions. That's not how it is for most of the illnesses I look after. If I'm looking after somebody with a chest infection, they want to get better. They'll take their antibiotics. Everybody knows what the goal is, and we're on a tug of war, but the disease is on the other end of the rope, and we're all pulling against it. I think this is a really, really important thing for us to think about. How do we help a young person to understand that we're not pulling against them, we're pulling against their disease. And in fact, how do we take it one step further? How do we get them to help us to beat this disease? Because that is a real challenge here. If we think about in a tug of war, sometimes in a tug of war, all you can do is just hang on. You dig your feet in, and you hang on and you try not to give too much ground and sometimes you have to give a little bit of ground because that's all you can do and that's okay what isn't okay is letting go of the rope or giving up or walking away you can't do that and sometimes you have to then dig in get a fresh grip and start trying to walk backwards one of the real challenges is how do we as professionals, as carers, as people who care about the young person, how do we all make sure that we're holding on together, that we're all dug in together, that we're all pulling together? And how do we try and help the young person to understand that we're all on the same side and they're on the same side of us, even though they don't feel like this? This is a huge challenge and really, really difficult and is a day-on-day -day struggle but is a really, really important thing for us to think about as we try to beat these illnesses. When I was talking about spiders and the fear of spiders and actually trying to help somebody to eat when they are so scared of eating, one of the things that I mentioned was that this is hard enough if you're trying to help somebody overcome a phobia, but it's particularly challenging if the young person doesn't really see the need to. Particularly if they're scared of taking that step backwards and actually they seem to have persuaded themselves that they're quite happy where they are and nobody needs to interfere and nobody needs to intervene and even if they did it would be pointless and hopeless. I talked about the fact that we need to try and hold on to hope for the young people one of the things I'd like to just think about here is this idea of perspective. If you are deeply entrenched in combating an eating disorder, it might be a little bit like looking down at the ground and all you can see is a tiny little bit of the ground and your shoes and that's about it. It's incredibly hard to see anything more than the eating disorder, to imagine that there can be anything more than this eating disorder ever again in the whole of your life. But I want you to imagine still looking down at the ground, but being in a hot air balloon, gradually moving up above the ground to the point where you might be able to see the house where you were and the street and the village and part of the county where you were. Our job as people who care for young people with eating disorders is to be able to take a step back and see that bigger picture and get that perspective because the young people we're dealing with often are incapable of seeing that big picture and probably don't even want to. And their eating disorder is not allowing them to see that bigger picture or imagine that there might be a bigger picture. Their lives can become so diminished by this constant battle with eating, and fears and negotiation and the backwards and forwards of an eating disorder that their ability to have any perspective on their situation is gone. Our job sometimes is to be able to take that bigger picture, to change the perspective, to think, well, what could this be like? 
because it may well be that we need to be thinking about eating and food for part of the day, but we also need to be thinking about the things that are important, that the young person enjoys and loves, whether it's seeing their friends or playing the trumpet or reading books or painting. And actually those things are important because those are the things that give their life meaning and value that might have got squashed out by the eating disorder. And we need to be the ones who can take the step back get that fresh perspective, fresh eyes, and see what might be in front of the young person that they can't see for themselves. My favorite tree is the sequoia. It may not be the tallest tree, it may not live for the longest, but by volume and mass, these are the biggest trees on earth. And they start from the tiniest little seeds. An individual sequoia tree will release thousands of seeds in its life. And those tiny, tiny little seeds will one day potentially grow up into these massive trees. I sometimes think that when I'm seeing a young person with an eating disorder and they've lost hope and they've lost any idea that things could be any better for them, we need to hold on to that hope a bit like that seed that can become the sequoia. We need to understand that inside of this horrible, broken, eating disordered situation, there is still a young person. A young person who's deeply tortured potentially by what's going on in their heads and their bodies. But we have to be able to hang on to that hope. What we know is that the young people who have eating disorders can, with the right help and support, go on to live long, healthy, fruitful lives. There is no reason why they can't, as long as we can get them the help they need. And so whenever I'm seeing somebody with an eating disorder, I try and imagine the sequoia trees, and I try and see where those little seeds of hope are, because those are the things that get us through the days and the weeks and the months ahead of them. I mentioned chess earlier in this presentation. I'd like to talk about another couple of board games. First of all, the game of Snakes and Ladders. I think this is a really nice, simple analogy that helps us think about the day-to-day -day of looking after somebody with an eating disorder. It's ludicrous to imagine that as soon as you get a diagnosis, and you know what the right treatment is, and you get onto that treatment, it's gonna be plain sailing from here on in. That's not how life works, that's not how eating disorders work. Our job is to think about the game of snakes and ladders. Think about stepping one step at a time, stepping forward, sometimes going two, three, four steps, but being mindful of the snakes along the way that are gonna be things that trip us up. What are the things that are more likely to trigger a young person into a relapse or make that day harder for them or that meal harder for them? What are the things that are going to be problematic for them? Because the problem is some of those snakes are actually gonna be things that are not immediately obvious. For instance, you might think, this is awful, let's go for a week's holiday. Now that might be a great idea. But going away for a week, taking a week out of treatment, a new environment, maybe with people who are out swimming and wearing swimming costumes, that might be a really terrible idea. And so one of the things I'd really like to be thinking about is what are those snakes? And if you're not sure, it's best to think about it if you're going to change something. Because what we actually want to do is be building ladders. What we want to be doing is thinking, what are the things that are going to help this process speed up as fast as it might possibly be? What are the things that are going to help us get a bit ahead of the game that are more likely to build a young person up? The other game that I think is a, a useful analogy is the idea of a, a jigsaw puzzle. Now, there are many ways of doing jigsaw puzzles. You might just get all the pieces and just try and do the jigsaw puzzle by randomly picking up pieces. Or you might do what most people would do, which is to start by sorting out the corner pieces and the edge pieces and giving yourself some sort of a framework to work from. And once you've got the corners and the edges, you might start focusing on that little bit of red because there's a few pieces that have those bits of red. You go for the easy wins, you go for the obvious things, you go for the things that are most likely to work. 
And I sometimes think that with eating disorders, it can just seem like this massive pile of pieces in the middle of the room that somebody's just thrown up in the air and they've all landed on the floor. But in amongst those pieces are the corners and the edges and those bright bits of red. And if we start trying to put them together, at least we've got a starting place. And at least we're starting to build up momentum. And so I'll often think on ward rounds about snakes and about ladders and about jigsaw puzzles and about corner pieces. And we'll try and muddle through the best that we can, mindful of the fact that some days are just going to be bad days. And that's how life is. But as long as we're having more good days than bad days, we'll get there. Now we're going to hear from some young people about what they would like other people to know about eating disorders. Um, I think the biggest thing I'd want any kind of professional to know is that it really isn't a choice and it is a very complicated illness and that we don't necessarily choose to behave the way we do. We are kind of stuck in this illness and at times it, the illness itself is very directive over our behaviour. Um, so we might say things and do things but that isn't us and that isn't us that's talking or choosing to behave like that. I think a lot of the time when you interact with someone with an eating disorder, you sometimes are talking directly to the eating disorder and not the young person, which is very, I think, hard for professionals to understand. But I think something to keep in mind that sometimes you won't be talking to the young person themselves, but rather the eating disorder, um, which is why I think where the kind of like reluctance to recover might sometimes come through um, but I think just try to be open and kind of a willingness to kind of support them and kind of get the help that they need um, I think is the best thing that other professionals can kind of do to support a young person. What I'd like people to know about eating disorders is that um, it's very much not a choice um, it's sufferers don't there's this common misconception that it's for attention or that it's only very superficial kind of um about your body um but it's not that there's always so much wrapped up in uh in an eating disorder um i think a lot of people have this misconception as well that it's uh, physical illness um, but it's very much a mental illness and it's very hard to recover it's definitely possible um, but people sufferers need support and they need understanding um, definitely for to uh, to recover easier I, I mean having a support a network of support you know people around you teachers parents um, who understand what you're going through and are patient with you and will listen to you um, is so helpful to any sufferer who's trying to recover. I think if people took the time, I mean their own time, to definitely do a bit of research about uh, the specific eating disorder um, and there are resources online um, like YouTube videos or articles uh, from people with eating disorders themselves explaining what it's like. I think I'd like people to understand that eating disorders are a mental illness. Um, so you tr should treat them like a physical illness. You know, if someone's broken their leg, you know, you make it you make changes to accommodate that person if you if if someone's suffering with a migraine you do the same and i think eating disorders because it's sometimes sometimes it's not even a visible disorder um and because there's this misconception that it's a choice and yeah, so people choose to not eat or choose to exercise or overeat or whatever it might be, um, there still needs to be that same level of understanding as if it were a physical illness and that same patience and that same accommodation. Now we'll consider some of the practical strategies and techniques. 
If you are concerned that a young person may have an eating difficulty, please do not adopt a watch and wait approach. The earlier a difficulty is identified, the earlier interventions can be offered and the better the prognosis and outcome. Transparency is crucial, so discussing and sharing concerns with the young person directly, as well as with parents and carers, is the first step. Ensuring that you have consent and seeking consultation from services such as the Hampshire Eating Disorder Team can help you, the family and the young person decide on next steps, which may include making or supporting a referral to the Eating Disorder Team. Even if a young person is denying a difficulty or appears to be minimising their difficulties, it is important that you have a discussion with them if you have concerns. It's important that a young person knows you're on the same side. You want the young person to be happy, healthy and enjoying life. And that's why you're needing to check out with them and others any worries that you may have. Even though it's hard to see a young person in distress, it's important where possible that they have choice and responsibility for how they behave, respond and manage to difficulties. Provide them with time and space to express how they feel so that hopefully you can agree a way forward together. Similarly, when you are sharing concerns with parents and carers, be mindful that this could be the first time that concerns are being raised with them. They may need some time to process what you're telling them and they may want to sort of come back to you to discuss the next steps. Be as clear as you can be about your concerns and emphasise the importance of working together for the shared goal of that young person's health, happiness and well-being. If parents are not in agreement with your concerns, like be open to hearing their point of view and seek consultation from relevant colleagues. Um, and you can also seek consultation from the eating disorder team. Or you may need to consider in some situations whether you consult with your safeguarding colleagues. Now we'll consider advice for different domains of a young person's life. Starting with education, be guided by the healthcare team about what and how much a young person is able to do, either in school or at home. Have regular contact with a young person and their family to review progress, problem solve any challenges or barriers and to agree action plans regularly. Discuss meal support provision options for during school or college. Avoid arbitrary weight-based cutoffs for allowing young people into school. This isn't recommended. Restrictions and limitations should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into consideration many different factors. Try to provide a clear roadmap for additional support if a young person is struggling or for catching up on schoolwork if school's been missed. Consider extenuating circumstances for exams, such as breaks or extra time, and that's especially important if the young person has multiple exams on the same day, or if exams run into scheduled snack or meal times. Avoid running eating disorder support groups where young people eat together, as this can cause distress for individuals and can create unhealthy dynamics between those that are struggling, particularly if there's not a trained adult to manage this. And ultimately, normalise that it's okay to make mistakes and not be perfect. Praise and reward effort over outcome. Be clear in communication, especially regarding action plans. Follow up verbal conversations via email. Repeat and revisit key information and points. Families have many different appointments and there can be a lot of information, so it can be really helpful to have information in writing as well as verbally. And don't be afraid to reiterate important information and messages to ensure that these have been received. Kindness and compassion are key. Families are doing the best that they can and this is a hard journey. Remember that families are the most helpful resource in managing and overcoming an eating difficulty. They need to feel empowered and supported in this journey. Be honest and realistic to moderate and manage expectations. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't ignore your concerns if the family don't share your concerns or if you feel the family are struggling to cope. 
It may be that the family would benefit from additional support from children's services in order to manage the family needs collectively. Or in some cases, the child may need the formal structure of safeguarding measures in order to access and receive the help and support that they require. In respect to physical health, always be wary of medically unexplained weight loss. It's better to get things checked out as soon as possible rather than to wait. Be guided by the healthcare team around what and how much a young person is able to do either at school or at home. Avoid commenting on a young person's physical appearance in any way, positive or otherwise. Remember that psychological recovery can take longer than physical recovery. Just because somebody may be weight restored or of average weight does not mean that they're not still struggling psychologically. And lastly, discourage calorie counting or use of fitness tracking apps if you become aware that any young person is engaging with these. When it comes to the emotional and mental health, one of the most powerful things anyone can do is to validate how a young person is feeling. Getting the basics in place can both prevent crisis and help to manage when things are tough. So with that in mind, try to help young people to attend to mental health first aid. So things such as following good sleep hygiene rules, being organised and practising safe social media usage. Use your influence. You're a role model. Role model self-compassion and kindness. Try to avoid self-critical and weight stigma focused conversations focus on and celebrate values, the personal qualities and characteristics that make people unique. And try to encourage young people to focus on what is important in life, other than appearance and weight. Focus on and celebrate values, the personal qualities and characteristics that make people unique. Try to encourage young people to focus on what's important in life, other than on things such as weight and appearance. Don't be afraid to ask if a young person is feeling safe. Sometimes young people find it easier to answer this direct question as opposed to having to initiate a conversation about how they may be feeling. Providing opportunities to regularly talk about feelings and share when things are tough will help to normalise this and in turn encourage openness. When it comes to communication, you will need to be guided by your knowledge of the young person and their personal preferences for how they communicate. Some young people can tolerate face-to-face -face discussions, others prefer texting or talking on the phone. But whichever medium you're using, be patient. Insight and motivation to engage and work towards change may be variable. Find time to have conversations, don't rush these. Be prepared for a young person to deny or minimise the difficulties they're experiencing. Focus on non-problem talk too, you know, encourage discussions around hopes and dreams, things that the young person enjoys or is inspired and motivated by. When you hear the words, I feel fat, this should be a big red flag. And it's a conversation starter, not necessarily about weight, but more about how the young person is feeling vulnerable and unhappy. Use this as a platform to be curious about how the young person is feeling more generally. Try not to enter into sort of lengthy debates, bargaining or arguments when it comes to food or eating. This is only going to result in stuckness and frustration on both your parts. You may have to agree to disagree. If we remind ourselves of the octopus once again, it's important to consider siblings of young people with eating disorders and the impact that it may be having on them. It's an incredibly difficult time for the whole family and that includes siblings. As professionals, you may want to be mindful of and consider other options such as young carer support, additional emotional well-being support in the form of nurture groups or ELSA provision, mentorship or buddying schemes. It's important to consider like the individual needs and review these regularly, as well as identifying any specific emotional or mental health difficulties that may be present independent of what's going on for the young person with the eating disorder. Siblings are people in their own right too. Now we're going to hear from some young people about their experiences of what other people did that was helpful and made a positive difference to them in their recovery journey. I think, although I wouldn't have said it at the time and I wouldn't have admitted that this was helpful, I think trying to support me in a bit of a tough love kind of approach worked. You know, having that kind of understanding and, you know, that kind of support, like, yeah, I'm here if you need me, but also, like you need to eat at the end of the day and you need to gain weight or whatever. Um, 
that kind of approach I think did help. I hated it at the time, but I think I needed that kind of direct push, particularly from my parents to start getting over it. Um, in terms of support from other professionals, for instance, my teachers, um, some most of my teachers were actually really lovely and supportive. I think there were some issues with the more senior staff members in that they didn't necessarily appreciate or understand uh, what I was going through and thought I was kind of just like every other stressed year 11, for example. Um, but my actual teachers were really understanding and tried to... One of them actually had an eating disorder herself as a teenager and she was incredible actually she kind of did everything she could um and she was very supportive she actually offered to kind of eat lunch with me at times when um that was becoming quite difficult um and just openly kind of talking about it i think for just people to kind of say that you know i'm here if i you need me um i think was very um what's the word it was very reassuring um, so I think a mixture of the kind of tough love, but also the willingness to help you and support you, um, I think was very important to me. I think for myself, definitely having my family there for me, uh, was super important. Um, seeing my family being affected by my eating disorder definitely encouraged me to recover and having their support and having them there to listen to me just talk about how I was feeling really honestly and in a way that may have not even been understandable to them but just to have someone there to say oh, I'm feeling like this today I'm struggling with this this happened and it really triggered me um was really important and I think I, for me as well, it was having them there to remind me of, it sounds silly, but of who I was when I was little. And would I, would I have done this to my four-year-old self? And obviously not. Um, so I, in my recovery, um, this is very specific to me, but I took a trip to Disneyland with my parents and it reminded me of how I should be because I didn't want to ruin Disneyland for myself. Um, so I ate and I had fun and it was difficult, but I think that was the sign of, oh, I'm really treating myself badly because I, I wouldn't do this to anyone else. I wouldn't wish this upon anyone else. So I think definitely having my family support and their understanding um, helped me a lot. And also um, resources online. There are a few YouTubers that I watched who had been through recovery and made videos on recovery, who's just seeing their journey and having them talk about their journey and feeling like I wasn't alone, that this weird, horrible experience that I thought was unique to me they were saying the exact same things, the exact same sensations, things that I hadn't even noticed. I couldn't articulate myself. I was seeing them articulate and that made me feel like I wasn't alone. And it made me feel like if they can recover and they went through the same thing as me, then I can recover too. Thanks to the young people for sharing their personal experiences. We've now reached the end of module four, but before moving on to the start of module five, please complete some feedback by clicking on the QR code below.